Breaking news this evening. There's been a major incident at Manchester Arena. Emergency services say they're responding to reports of an explosion during the Ariana Grande gig. Police emergency. Hi, we, we, we heard an explosion there by Victoria train station. We've, we've got over 20 people trying to get through, telling us the same. So they're going to clear down on you as long as you stay where you are and safe and we'll get officers on route. 100 days ago, a suicide bomber attacked children and parents, leaving a pop concert in Manchester. All the roads around the arena have been closed off and police are asking people to avoid the area, just stay away from the area. 22 were killed, 59 seriously injured. This is the story of that night and of what followed. I just remember feeling really, really hot and then I dropped to the floor. Um, cause to be honest, I thought I was on fire. I didn't know what, what had gone on. A story of lives remembered. I gave birth to that little girl. I brought her up for 15 years and she was be she'd been taken from me in the worst possible way. And of lives being rebuilt. When I found out, I'd be paralysed. I didn't cry, um, I wasn't angry. And it was just, I think, I think just an acceptance um, to, the, to the situation. It's the story of a city and its people who came together to comfort the victims. It's like having a big life belt round you and it's keeping you up there, you know what I mean? People might not think it's anything, but it's everything. Yeah, it's everything. And to make a stand. Are we a little shaken? Yes. Will we be beaten? Will we give in to the hate and divide? No. We are Manchester. Across Manchester and beyond, thousands of youngsters were getting ready for a concert by the American pop star Ariana Grande. Georgina Callender was an Ariana superfan. She'd even met her idol, a memory she treasured. She starts getting ready, changed out of her college clothes, and then she wiped her shoes and then put a bit of makeup on, and then she was ready to go. Off she went, come on, Mum, it's time, she says. I can't wait, come on, Mum, hurry up. So he had to wait for her friend in the centre of, of um, the entrance. And we waited for a friend and she came along and she gave me a massive hug and a big kiss and she said, I'll see you later, Mum. And I said, yeah, I'll see you later, love you. And she said, love you. We'd actually spent the day cuddled on the couch watching TV um, and then it was, right, Mum, I need to go and get ready. I'm like, you're not going till five o'clock. Yeah, but I've got my hair to do, my makeup. And off she went. And it, it was just a madhouse for the next four hours while she got everything ready, because it had to be perfect. I had a free period, so I left at two, um, you know, and um, I don't take as long to get ready. So we go after school, me and Mum pick live up, and we're going to Manchester. We walk into St Anne's and we get a uh, McDonald's. I just said to her, really enjoy yourself and try and leave as the last song's playing. Try and leave and then you won't be waiting for trams for hours. And she went, I will do, Mum. I know what I'm doing. I'm old enough now. Don't worry. And she just gave me a kiss, gave me a hug and went out the door. She'd asked me to take her, her outfits down for her um, for half past three when she came out of school, um, which I did. Um, she came to the door uh, of the car, opened the door, and she just said, had I got a, a thing? So I said, yes, everything's here. She said, have you got any money for me? <laughs> so I said, well, I've only got, I think I've got about £20. And she just said, oh, well, that's fine, that's fine. She said, I can get something with that. And uh, I just said to him, I'll just have a wonderful time and I'll see you later. And that was it. It was the first time that Nell had been to a concert without her family. Martin Hibbert was there with his teenage daughter. He'd bought her VIP tickets as a special Christmas present. My daughter's a big uh, Ariana Grande fan, so it was always kind of uh, in my head that uh, 
you know, if, if these tickets uh, came up, that it'd be a, a nice surprise. The arena was packed, um, so, you know, there was a good atmosphere. Um, and the noise was just, you know, ridiculous, you know. Especially when she first came out, it was literally just kind of like piercing your eardrums. She was really good. She was really good live. Which was, it was nice because sometimes you don't know if someone's going to be the same live as they are when you listen to them. Yeah, everyone was doing like the wave, you know, the Mexican wave. That was kind of funny. When the lights came up in the arena, um, we just, because I was on the end of the row, the stairs were next to me, so we had to kind of get out so everyone else could get out. And there was lots of other people going out as well. It didn't seem like we were the first ones. And then we left the concert once she'd done her encore. And then that's, what, then that's when it all happened. That's when... That's when it happened. Oh, my God, what just American pop star Ariana Grande had just left the stage at the Manchester Arena. Her fans, mostly youngsters and their parents, were leaving to begin their journeys home. As they did, a suicide bomber waiting in a foyer detonated his device. It was filled with hundreds of metal nuts and bolts. We walked up at the arena uh, entrance, at the fire entrance. All of a sudden, this orange flash, like, like a fire would give off, um, a bit like a firework kind of colour, followed by a thundering explosion. Oh, my God! There was this distinctive explosion echoed around the arena. Then we set off at, at the run-up, up the stairs. I just remember feeling really, really hot, and then you, I dropped to the floor. Because, um, to be honest, I thought I was on fire. I didn't know what, what had gone on, um, and I just... I looked down to my legs and I saw quite a lot of blood. There was a lot of smoke about uh, and I just remember hearing uh, a lot of people screaming and then I remember uh, looking over to my daughter uh, and I could see that, you know, she, she wasn't in a, in a good way. You know, she'd been obviously been hit uh, in the head, uh, but she was breathing, uh, which was a good sign. And at that point I noticed uh, there was a lot of blood coming from my left arm uh, and quite a lot of blood coming from uh, my neck uh, to the point where, you know, it was kind of gathering in a, in a pool. I, I think I knew at that point that I was dying uh, because I was starting to shiver. There's quite a few people that we couldn't do anything for them, whether um, it was just their injuries were too bad for what we had. Um, the first aid kit that I carry isn't the most comprehensive. I had a tourniquet and a bandage, so... The amount of people that were injured, that obviously that doesn't go very far. Um, we ended up making makeshift tourniquets out of um, T-shirts off the uh, merchandise stall. I could see that uh, there were, uh, you know, designated first aid people that were kind of walking around and looking at those that were severely injured and those that had unfortunately uh, died. Uh, at that point, they'd actually put um, a blanket over my daughter. Um, and I was like, no, she, she's still breathing. So they took that off. And then I remember uh, a gentleman stood at my side and he was instructed to put a pad uh, on my neck and uh, it, just, it just all goes white then. And then uh, I kind of pass out. 15-year-old Adam Lawler, who'd been there with his friend Olivia, had also been seriously injured. He tried to call his mum to let her know what had happened. I couldn't speak, really. Or it was unintelligible what I was saying. I would spat blood on the phone while I was trying to call her. And um, 
some member of the public called Darren helped me and told my mum the situation. I seen Adam, who was on his hands and knees, but he was moving around quite a lot, so he was, like, rocking backwards and forwards and making quite a lot of noise. Half his face looked to have been blown away, and he had, I, remember, I just remember him having a nut in his hand, and I seen his, he was, had hold of his phone. He had mum on the screen. I just picked it up and spoke to his mum. I said, he is all right. I said, he can't talk, I said, but he is moving, and I presume that he will be all right. Within minutes, police and paramedics were on their way. The sense of urgency over the radio, we, we were aware that this was something very serious. We don't know if the scene is safe. We don't know if there's a secondary bomb. We don't know if there's an active shooter. Are you happy to deploy? I think at the time, I couldn't really say yes. I just put my thumb up, because um, there was a little bit of a knot in my throat. Um, and we made our way through the station and up towards the foyer. As Leah and her team headed to the scene, people were still fleeing in the opposite direction, many with serious injuries. Eight-year-old Lily Harrison was at the concert with her mum, Lauren, and dad, Adam. She'd been hit by shrapnel. So we'd managed to go through um, some doors that headed towards um, like the arena car park. Um, we, we'd just lay her on the car park floor and she was just unconscious and she just wouldn't wake up. <laughs> a police officer came across us um, and he kind of looked at Lily and you could hear him on the radio trying to like see if he could get us an ambulance, but there wasn't going to be any chance that an ambulance could get to us. Um, so and Adam just said to him, he was like, you need to get us out of here, like, I need to get my daughter to the hospital. My colleague said that um, she was seriously injured and he thought that um, th that she was having difficulty breathing. Um, he suspected that some of the shrapnel may have punctured her lung. Um, so I advised my colleague that the van was a short distance away uh, and that the, probably the quickest way we could get the, the medical um, attention was by me taking her to the, to the hospital. On the way, I was quite concerned that if Lily lost consciousness, then I would have to stop the vehicle um, and give CPR. Um, so I kept shouting into the bat, albeit it was quite loud with the, the sirens going. I kept shouting, is she conscious breathing? Dad kept reassuring me, yes, yeah, she's fine. Every minute that we were kind of in that car park, more people were streaming down with injuries and it was absolute chaos. We were just so glad because we got, obviously got out of there really quickly. Um, and we were the first ones then to the children's hospital. That's how quick she got us there. Back at the arena, the scale of the atrocity was becoming clear. The most patients I've ever dealt with in my career is, is free, free at once. Um, so being faced with 26 patients to deal with, um, and there's two of you, uh, free, of, free with the advanced paramedic that was in there with us. It's difficult. It's very, very difficult. We couldn't be carrying the patients out. We needed to be in there with them. Um, so the, the police officers that were on scene were absolutely amazing. Um, they went and they got anything, any makeshift stretcher that they could get their hands on using um, cue rails, um, notice boards, anything that could hold the weight of a person. Georgina Callender's mum, Leslie, had been waiting for her outside. I just knew something had happened to her and it must have been serious because she couldn't get to her phone to ring me. Then all these police cars came and ambulances and, and it was getting very, 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 very worrying indeed. And then eventually we were the only two people in the road Everyone had gone, there was no one else around, and so we snuck in, and um, uh, it wasn't good. But I saw there was like 10 men all around her, carrying her down these stairs, and they just kept working on her all the time with the CPR. And it seemed to last forever before she was ready to go in an ambulance. We got to the hospital, they wheeled her in, and then after 23 minutes, 
They said, I don't think she's going to survive her injuries. Mrs. Callender, would you like to come in? And so I went in and I just held her. And that was that. All of the seriously injured were now in hospital. Adam's parents had driven to the city centre, desperate to find their son and his friend Olivia. We just kept trying the both phone numbers for uh, Olivia and for uh, Adam to see if we could get contact with either of them. And both well, one of them was, um, uh, was just going to voicemail and one of them was just ringing out. You rang Charlotte, didn't you, and just said, we know that something's happened. We're on our way to Manchester mm. trying to find out what's going on. We'll keep in touch. Both my brothers, uh, my brother's uh, son-in-law and my uh, eldest son got in the cars with several other people, mm. went into Manchester and started the search. We went round every hospital known that we're going to take the people in. Um, and that's when uh, my younger brother um, came across Adam. So he related the message back to us saying that they found Adam. Um, which kept our hopes going, didn't it? But I thought to myself, if, if Adam's all right, then Charlie's got, Olivia's got to be all right. They'd have been together. Adam's parents made their way to the children's hospital where they'd learned he'd been taken. The first thing we noticed, or I noticed, was a sea of blue lights and ambulances and police cars. And, and, and as we walked through the door, a doctor came to see us, didn't he? And the, the words from the doctor was, I just need to prepare you. And we thought, prepare us for what? And um, when they drew back that curtain, um, nothing as a parent would prepare you for how Adam's injuries uh, and how he looked. Lucy Jarvis's mum and dad had also driven into Manchester. Like an urgency. Our daughter's been injured at this thing at the end of the end tonight. Right, OK, just bear with me. What's your name, please? Kath Jarvis. What's your daughter called, Kath, sorry? Lucy Jarvis. How old is she? 17. 17 years old. As soon as we've right. got any details of your daughter, I'll get the officers to ring you back, OK? Eventually tracing their daughter to a hospital in the city. I don't know how long we'd been there, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And it was just getting more and more frightening. If it could be any more frightening than it already was. And then I remember a nurse coming in and said, you've got to come with me now. Um, so we, we, we marched down this corridor, not knowing what to expect. They walked past the bereavement suite mm. and it was open. So we just thought the worst, didn't we? I remember as we walked past that, feeling relieved, because I thought, if they take us in there, that's the end of the world. And then we got there and Lucy was on a, a, a trolley, ready to go to theatre. And we had probably a minute, maybe two, where we just managed to say a few words to her. For the next 14 hours, surgeons worked to remove the shrapnel that had peppered Lucy's body. During that period of time, different people would come in and see us periodically, different surgical teams. Somebody from the vascular team came in because um, one of the pieces of shrapnel had, had nicked a, a main artery in the upper leg. Um, so that was a very dangerous time for her during that, that first period of, of uh, being in the operating theatre. Martin Hibbert and his daughter were just 10 metres away from the bomber when he detonated his device. As the blast went off, I've pretty much shielded my daughter from the explosion. I've, uh, I sustained 22 uh, separate uh, wounds or injuries, which were all uh, either shrapnel or uh, nuts and bolts uh, that were in the, uh, the, the bomb that he'd, he'd made. Um, it was just that one, one bolt that's kind of gone through her head, uh, which probably would be my shoulder, why I couldn't have made it 23, really. Because um, other than the one that's hit her there, she, she, she's not got anything. Martin's daughter had received a serious head injury. Her family have asked us not to identify her. The pair were taken to separate hospitals, with surgeons at Salford Royal operating to save Martin's life. Uh, Martin had uh, quite a significant injury to his neck, which uh, led to decreased blood flow uh, from two of the blood vessels which supply the brain. 
He also had a, a bolt which was lodged in his abdomen. He also had an injury to his spinal cord and we found that he was unable to feel anything below his waist and he was not able to move his legs. When I found out I'd be paralysed for you know, the rest of my life, um, I, I didn't cry, um, I wasn't angry, um, I, I, I didn't get any of that. Um, and it was just, I think, I think just an acceptance um, to, the, to the situation. Um, you know, my daughter was alive, uh, I was alive. You know, yeah, it was a, a case of, right, you know, we, we, we've got that out of the way. Uh, what, what do we do next type of an attitude. In total, medical teams at eight different hospitals were working flat out to treat the injured. But it was Manchester Children's Hospital which received the majority of the casualties. They were horrendous, traumatic injuries to children, um, which you never want to think about happening, and you certainly never want to see. And I think one of the, the hardest things, you know, I'm a mum, but I was taking phone calls from parents looking for their children, and in the middle of everything else, that was horrendous, um, because I couldn't help them, because I couldn't say, yeah, I've got your child, your child's safe. Many parents faced a terrible wait for answers. And when those answers came, it was sometimes the news they most dreaded. Olivia Campbell Hardy had been killed in the explosion. Eight-year-old Nell Jones. Fifteen-year-old Olivia Campbell Hardy. Eighteen-year-old Georgina Callender. Just three of the 22 people murdered in the suicide bomb attack at the Manchester Arena. In the days and weeks that followed, the victims' families were surrounded by the love and support of their friends, relatives, and even total strangers. Manchester's St Anne's Square became the focus for a city's grief and its compassion. For us, it was, it was a lifesaver, really. You know, to go there and just see people just going in with bunches of flowers was just fantastic. It's like having a big life belt round you and it's keeping you up there, you know what I mean? You're not falling into that pit all the time. Yeah, so yes, it, 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 people might not think it's anything, but it's everything. Yeah, it's everything. It truly is overwhelming to think that all these people actually care about you and think about, are thinking about you. It's uh, fantastic and, and, it, and it, it does show the strength of the communities deep down. It, um, it, and it is very important because if we lose that, they have won. And um, I don't think they ever will win doing what they do. And 400 miles away, that grief and compassion has been shared by the people of a small Scottish island. Ailey McLeod travelled to the concert from Barra in the Outer Hebrides with her mum and school friend, Laura McIntyre. Laura was seriously injured in the explosion. Ailey was killed. Her funeral, the first of the 22, was the most poignant of homecomings. That day, um, the whole island came to a standstill. Everyone wanted to be there, but we wanted to make it a day that we focused on Ailey. Those 14 years of our life were precious. Every year, we just wanted it to shine out. The beaming smile that Ailey had, the, the music that she loved, we wanted the, the celebration of the Mass to shine out with bits of music and for her age group to be a part of it. Millie Dennehy knew Ailey well. She was just always such like a happy person, and like if you're like in her presence, she'd always just sort of like lighten the whole atmosphere up. Piping was a big part of her life. Our friendship sort of started when we started piping together. And Millie was one of the pipers who played at her friend's funeral. 
the tunes they played were the ones she was playing the day before she went to the concert. It just doesn't seem real because living like on an island like this, you just wouldn't think something like that would happen. It doesn't really get easier. It's something that we will get through, we'll never forget, but we will carry on and we will just, we'll carry the pain, and, but we carry love. I'm thankful to God that God blessed our wee island with a beautiful girl like Ailey, and I will never forget Ailey. Her memory will always live on here. For those injured and seriously hurt, the days and weeks since the attack have been difficult, physically and emotionally. When Adam Lawler first woke after surgery, his injuries prevented him from speaking. But he still wanted to know what had happened to his friend, Olivia. He wrote things down, and he sort of wrote down what happened to Liv. So I took his pen and paper off and I just said to him, unfortunately, sweet actually didn't make it. So he just sort of went like that, heartbroken. When I found out Liv had died, I was sick. It was pure blackness. What came out of me should, should never come out of any human being. That, I believe, was my anger, my pain, my devastation. All the emotions I could feel around this horrific event, losing someone you're very close to, who you love at such a young age. Adam was discharged from hospital after three weeks, his resilience echoing the spirit of his home city. There's hard times again in these streets of our city, but we won't take defeat and we don't want your pity because this is the place where we stand strong together with a smile on our face, Mancunians forever, because this is the place in our hearts, in our homes, because this is the place that's a part of our bones, because Manchester gives us such strength from the fact that this is the place Choose love, Manchester. Thank you. Manchester! 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 Though back at home, Adam continues to be a regular visitor to the children's hospital. Scarring and burns from shrapnel in his legs and torso require regular cleaning and dressing. That looks amazing. Yeah. That looks brilliant compared to last week, doesn't it? Really, really, really good. A bolt passed through his cheek and another through his chin. He lost seven teeth. Try six sizzling sausages. <laughs> <laughs> six sizzling sausages. There you go. So we just practice that at home. Seashell, seashells on the seashell. Yeah, so it'll just take a little while to get these. Yeah. Both of Adam's legs were also fractured. That's healed, basically. Well, that's what the doctor will tell you now. When you go back, he'll have a good look at those and see whether he's happy. All right. And then you can let us know whether to get rid of your boots. The boots have been protecting his broken legs. Today, he's going to find out if he can finally remove them. Um, so they've determined that I no longer need the boots. Um, I'm going to weave myself off the crutches over the next few weeks and um, I'm back to good old normal shoes. It feels like possibly the most important milestone of all, it, bar coming out of hospital. I'm, I'm back. That's, that's how it feels. Martin Hibbert was paralysed in the explosion. His daughter was also seriously injured. After a month, he was on the move to a specialist unit where he can begin to adjust to life in a wheelchair. What we're going to be doing is we're going to go from the position you're in. Yeah. So make sure you position your feet so you've got good grounding, OK? So when you're ready, lean forward, big push up through your arms. You know, I'm 40 years old, so I've had kind of, you know, a good kind of 38 years of, of walking around, and 
you know you don't think about things you just do it because you've done it over the over your lifetime so in a way it's like starting from scratch again you've got to think about everything you're doing everything is new he's got a bit of a way to go yeah he needs to work more on his upper body strength purely to be able to do that trans those transfers independently um you know at the moment he's real his confidence is growing which is another major aspect in it um but to be able to do that transfer he needs to work on not just his arms, he needs to work on his back, on his chest, on everything else, so all those muscle groups can work together to be able to move himself around. Physically, uh, it's very demanding on, on the arms and the triceps, uh, so it is you know, very painful, uh, but I know it's something that's going to you know, be very useful uh, when I leave here, so you know, you've got to do it, you've got to get through the pain. It's not just Martin's twice daily physio sessions that call for a high pain threshold. So I'm having a tattoo of the Manchester Bee, uh, and it's become the symbol uh, of the um, basically Manchester coming together after the arena bombing. With what I've been through, certainly over the last couple of months, uh, getting a tattoo is uh, you know certainly nothing compared to the pain I've had. So uh, so yeah, so I'm not nervous at all. Right, you ready? Yeah. Four hours later, and Martin's B is finished. Oh wow, absolutely fantastic. It just feels like it, it's right, you know what I mean? Like it, there's a jigsaw bit just, just been done. Do you know, does that make sense? Piece by painstaking piece, lives are being rebuilt. After a seven week stay in hospital, 17 year old Lucy Jarvis finally received the news she'd been hoping for. They told us only two or three days before we were actually going to go that, like, oh yeah, you can go home now. And we were like all in shock because we never thought it would be so soon. And it was just a, such a relief to know I could go home. Lucy's injuries still require regular medical attention. I've got a frame, like a fixator on my ankle. The pins that go through my feet have to be changed and cleaned every week. So they come every week to change them which takes quite a while. Um, they have to change my toe wound. Yep. My, I'm a broken toe, which is quite painful sometimes. How are you? Today, she's preparing to take her first steps in more than two months. I'm starting to go on crutches, which means that I'll be able to be a bit more mobile. We'll be here, don't worry. So crutches forward together, and you just step in between, make sure you've got a nice amount of space there. That's it. Oh, you're all right. You're good. You're good. Yeah. And again. Well done. You feel comfortable on your own, Lish? Yeah. That's your balance. third one. Seems much better. Don't already. feel like you're going to fall or. No. That's really good. I'm really impressed with you. Well done, young lady. Good, please. Yeah. Proud. Mm -hmm. I am. This. All these for bits. No, 17-year-old should have to go through this. Um, but she's. We've come out the other side, haven't we? And I'm hoping mm. that she'll move forward and she'll lead a happy, productive life and put all this behind her, mm. really, as best she can. I'm hoping to go back to college in September, so I'll be able to see my friends again and do normal things like college work, which I've not done any of. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm quite. I'm excited to be, do that in a normal setting again. Normality has almost been restored in the home of eight-year-old Lily Harrison. Lily was injured by shrapnel in the bombing, but today she's about to receive a very special visitor. Hi, Hi. Kate. Yeah, how are you, Lauren? Yeah, good to see you. And you? Come in. Thank you. Lily's very excited to see you. Thanks. Oh, she's just in here. Come through. Thank you. It's the first time that Kath Daly has seen Lily since rushing her to hospital on the night of the attack. Hi, how are you? Good. Good to see you again. You better? Yeah. Yeah, good. What are you doing there? Making a card. Oh, that's very nice of you. It's great to see you. Do we get a kiss? Yeah. Oh, we're just really grateful because obviously 
without you getting us there, then obviously it could have been a completely different situation. She's recovered so quickly and just, you can see what she's like now, yeah. then I think this is what I'm like, I, we don't know how to thank you because you said, oh, I was, I was just doing my job, but you said, <laughs> We just don't know how to say thank you. We don't. Yep. <laughs> You've said it. You don't. You don't need to say any more. Just seeing you guys here today is all the thanks I need. Honestly, really. Oh, is that for me? Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Do we get a hug? Oh, thanks, Lily. Thank you very much. Nearly three months have passed since the night of the attack. The injured and the families of those who died are slowly piecing together their lives. Martin Hibbert, paralyzed from the waist down in the explosion, has left hospital and moved to a respite center for people with disabilities. His twice daily physio sessions are continuing at the center. He's now using a hand bike to strengthen his arms and increase his overall level of fitness. It's just that sense of freedom, you know, being able to get out on a bike and again, just, you know, have that fresh air, a bit of sun and, you know, actually feel like you're doing a bit of exercise. There's a bit of a route that they do here and I think the record's 28 minutes to do two and a half miles. So one of my uh, achievements is trying to, trying to break that. So I'm down to kind of early 30 minutes now. His discharge date is looming and Martin's thoughts are turning toward the next step in his recovery. There is a bit of a, a worry about, you know, kind of going home and not having a, you know, a buzzer to press or a nurse on, on call. So like a couple of days ago, I fell out of my shower chair um, and it was weird, I think, for, for, for the first time in the, in the past three months, I actually felt disabled and that, that was quite hard to take. But on the flip side, being at home with my wife and, and our dog Alfie, being a family again, is a, is a greater feeling. His teenage daughter, who received a serious head injury in the attack, is also slowly on the mend. She's, uh, she's going to be in hospital for a few more months, but uh, you know, she's awake now and uh, you know, um, she, she can see and she can hear. Uh, she's just started eating. Um, it's going to be small, small steps, but uh, um, you know, it's, she's in the best place, so you know, uh, it takes as long as it takes. Martin's focus is firmly on the future. But in the family home of 14-year-old Nell Jones, her absence is still being keenly felt. You miss her all the time. She's always, she's always there at the back of your mind. All you want to do, all I want to do, is give her a hug. Even not even just, just to have her sitting on the sea sofa here, not even bothering with you. Just nonchalantly looking at her phone. You know, that, that'd be enough, you know. But uh, you'll never, no. never get that now. No. Today, Nell's family are visiting her school, where a memorial garden is planned. And those pebbles, that painted pebble lake, you see that there, and the yeah. big stepping stones. But you wanted them in, in that uh, gravel as well, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, light gravel, so she so showed up all around there. Yeah, so and then a bit darker in that. Yeah, yeah. so it leads but... in, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It'd be nice to have something permanent that's there in. Yeah. In, in her memory, that we, we can visit in years to come. And even when we come to have children, you know, somewhere we can take them and say, this is about you, this is for your auntie, this is, this is Nell's place. And the school have put together a memory box for the family to keep. When she came to the school, if you recall, she had to fill in something to introduce herself. And that was it. Yeah, I think the moment I opened it and there was the the, uh, the, the, the paper that she'd filled in when she started um, at, at high school to say what she wanted to achieve at high school and, and uh, what her best subject was and what her worst subjects were. Um, yeah, that kind of got me, really. And these are the, these are the books pasted in. 
there are obviously comments from friends. And... Yeah. I mean, we knew a friend's cared for her and that, but the tributes that her friends have written are just beautiful. <laughs> She'd be absolutely overwhelmed herself. Yeah, she would. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? There's, there's 22 families gone through this and they'll all be going through the same thing and each individual is special to them. It's lovely, isn't it? I would never, ever wish this on anybody, but we will get through it. We were privileged and very proud to have her for 14... 14 years? <laughs> yeah. So... They were 14 brilliant years. Fifteen-year-old Olivia Campbell Hardy's mum, Charlotte, and stepdad Paul are also trying to come to terms with the loss of a child. And their thoughts are turning towards a very special celebration. We got engaged about five years ago now, five, six years ago, uh, on Christmas Day. Uh, Ollie then sat around starting to plan the wedding. Even though we said it'd be a good few years down the line, she was determined that she was gonna plan it and it was gonna be perfect. Even though it's our wedding day, it'll be for her. And they're determined that her friend Adam will be a big part of their special day. Charlotte has kindly asked me to have the honour of walking her down the aisle at her wedding to Paul. Um, I was quite shocked at first, but I agreed, obviously, because I felt I feel a sense of duty to them, I feel a sense of responsibility. To go, um... Show me what show you what I've already got ready. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 going. Well, I'm not sure you can, can see here. Yeah, I, I know what to work around then, I know I have to look better. <laughs> you can better than Adam. Oh, there Blue was Olivia's favourite colour, so Adam has a particular look in mind for the wedding. Oh my goodness. Look at this. Who's getting married here? We'll just have to take a second best then, won't we? Okay. Well, the bad of the ball. And that looks like the colour I've been looking at that's going to be on the dress. And it's the same colour as the bridesmaid's dresses. I like the boots as well. I want to know when the modelling contract's coming through. Uh, give it a couple months. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he asked his mum in hospital if we blamed him. And my message straight back was, I'll never ever blame him. He's just an amazing young man. And I've got so much admiration for him. to live for Olivia. She was gone too soon and I want to give back what's been taken. take my legs but it's not going to stop me doing anything uh, and in fact I'll, I'll probably work harder for it now uh, because I love being a dad I love being a husband you know nobody's going to take that away from me let alone a terrorist I want people to, to come out of this with with love in their hearts I don't want people to to use Nell as an excuse to go around hating other people. She wasn't like that. She, she solved her problems with hugs, not fists. <laughs> and a few tears. A few tears, <laughs> a few tears. And that's how we want her to be remembered. I 
Are we a little shaken? Yes. Will we be beaten? Will we give in to the hate and divide? No. We are Manchester. Next tonight, join Tom Bradby for the ITV News at 10.